Today, we spotlight a source of hope and inspiration within Seattle's Central District. A group of people of different colors came together for a purpose. As we open the vault doors to explore the rich history behind the Liberty Bank building. It took the community to make this work, and it did. That's what I want them to know, that history was made. Preserving the legacy of the first Black-owned bank in the Pacific Northwest. Hello, I'm Tracy Leong. Liberty Bank opened in 1968, providing hope and financial freedom to minorities during a time when there wasn't much of either. The bank has been closed for decades and has since gone through a major transformation. In a community-led effort, today it continues to help the Central District. Michelle Purnell Hepburn's parents moved to Seattle from the South in 1941 with a dream to make a difference. My grandfather basically sent a, yes, uh, Western Union wire uh, to uh, my parents saying that the streets out here are paved with gold, meaning you could make something of yourself. You could do more. You could go farther as an African-American person out here than in the South where they were raised. And so uh, following that, they came out with my big sister, their mission to create financial equality as a response to redlining in our region. My father always believed that African Americans needed access to capital. Her parents, James and Mardine Purnell, were two of the 10 founders of Liberty Bank, the first black owned bank in the Pacific Northwest. We wanted our own access to capital. We wanted to be able to support the central area. We wanted to be able to support Again, the term then, minorities, the term today, people of color, to reach their business dreams, their home dreams. You couldn't just apply for a loan online. <laughs> you physically had to go. And so when Liberty Bank opened, it attracted over a million dollars in deposits. This is 1968, uh, in its first one or two months. That was unheard of. And also that was a time when you just didn't call your financial institutions and say, could you just transfer my dollars from here to there? You physically had to go to your financial institution, get a cashier's check, and then take it to then Liberty Bank. And so the community was thrilled. And the building itself, it was all about another extension of community is Mel Streeter, the architect, was also African-American. So it was built by us for us. Liberty Bank opened in May of 1968 during a tumultuous year. Seattle was entrenched in the civil rights movement and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. had just been assassinated. I was just proud that my parents were involved in something as amazing as either a credit union or even, you know, a commercial bank. It, it, it was, it was, it was exciting. Uh, the bank at the, the opening day, I was there opening day, um, got to get out of school. <laughs> <laughs> I was there opening day and there was television coverage. Now, that didn't just happen in 1968, and certainly in the African American community. And many of the founders were, I'd known them, <laughs> I was a kid, but I'd known them for a long time. <laughs> so it was all just so very exciting, and it was bold and it was risky, it was very, very risky. Not only for the institution, but for my family as well. For 20 years, Liberty Bank provided crucial financial services to Seattle's Central District, but it wasn't easy. There were times that the bank was robbed. There were times when I was lucky, and I will say just dumb luck, that I was never there when the bank was robbed. However, my dad was. I know there were times there were guns held to my dad's head. 
My parents were very strict with me and my whereabouts because people would try to get to my dad through me. Our phone was tapped. I could hear them on, I could get on the line to hear, but they're on. So having a financial institution in the hands of um, primarily a uh, minority owned, um, in a minority owned financial institution at that time, hmm, was not easy. And at the same time, I would say I have one of the documents, I have many documents, I seem to be the treasure trove of Liberty Bank for my family, and they would not allow my dad to be the first president. They would not allow not only a husband and wife, they would also not allow an African American to be the first president of a minority owned bank. Michelle's father would go on to become the third president of Liberty Bank. It was so novel at the time. It was so novel. And when President Jimmy Carter was interested in how to help minority-owned banks across the United States, my dad was president of the National Bankers Association. And I have a picture of my dad at the cabinet table sitting next to President Jimmy Carter, which I know was the highlight of his life. And her mother played a vital role as well. She was right beside him all the way. And to see them both either at an annual meeting and him doing his role, her doing her role, yeah, I'm, many children just don't get to see that. Uh, see their parents at their, you know, at the height of their careers and also at the height of their just service to the community. Uh, lifting as we climb was always a motto that you don't get anywhere by yourself. As you get lifted up, you have to lift someone else up. And so that's just the motto that we live by. And that has resonated with me all these years. As a little girl, Michelle remembers watching her parents with amazement. What Liberty Bank was able to do was support it in a more tangible financial way. Business loans for various entities, be they uh, uh, sole proprietors or partnerships, uh, restaurants, uh, churches, uh, barbershops, I mean, small business loans, mortgage loans, checking accounts, and very much like the credit union that uh, dad was uh, head of prior to Liberty Bank. He, I will say I, I've worked both on the for-profit side and the, and the not-for-profit side of financial institutions. Most of the time I've worked in credit unions. I wonder why, <laughs> because of, because of uh, mom and dad. And when I, wanted, when I say he ran it like a credit union, we knew everyone. It was a, it was more than community, it was a social community. Liberty Bank closed in 1988 and over the years changed ownership and then eventually sat vacant, but it still stood as a symbol of resilience. The effort to designate it as a landmark fell short, but Michelle's fight to preserve the bank's history became a community-led project by Capitol Hill Housing. They had meetings with the community and with Africatown and they really pushed for what meant most to the black community here. Joe Snowden is the Liberty Bank building site manager. The redevelopment project opened in 2019. It now provides affordable housing and support for black owned businesses. The company itself recognizes the issues and that you know people are being priced out of certain areas and we're trying to create affordable housing where a lot of people can't necessarily afford to live. So I think a lot of residents, in, they recognize that and they appreciate it and they really wanted to preserve as much of that history as possible. So they went through, so 
Yeah, like with the bricks, the basket woven bricks, those are bricks from the original building that the construction company was able to salvage. Um, and then just like with the safety deposit boxes that we have here, as well as all of the drum benches have safety deposit boxes in them. Parts of the original bank are still here um, and it wasn't all just demolished and tossed away. The first thing you see when you walk into the Liberty Bank building is the original vault door from the bank, which serves as a symbol of hope for the community and the people who live here. Michelle was on the advisory board for the redevelopment project, working with community organizations to help finalize the layout, artwork, key historical pieces, and a wall with the founder's photos. The fact that they were willing to raise the legacy and to keep the legacy. And let's face it, Seattle needs low cost housing. <laughs> <laughs> Desperately. And so it seemed to be the right thing to do. I get to preserve the legacy. Uh, mom, dad, all the founders get to be recognized. And we get to preserve the history. And we're doing good for the community at the same time. And for the residents, it reminds them of what once stood on 24th and Union. That helps people to take more pride in where they live at and know that it's not just any regular apartment building, but it's actually like a part of all of our history and even just a part of Seattle's history in general. You don't necessarily have to be African American to appreciate that Seattle was the place where the first black owned bank was at. And for Michelle, she wants the bank's story of perseverance to live on, a relevant message for all generations. That during a time prior, the, prior to the Civil Rights Act, prior to the Voting Rights Act, a group of people of different colors came together for a purpose, a purpose to better people of color in a financial way. And that even through the struggles of the 60s, which were many, not only nationally, but here as well, that that dream came true. And it took a village. It wasn't one person, it wasn't my dad, it wasn't my mom, it took the community to make this work, and it did. That's what I want them to know, that history was made, and a history of coming together for a common goal, all different races and creeds and colors came together and made a dream come true. A project that elevates the bank's legacy and the future of the Central District. You can catch plenty of other Black History Month content on our Smart TV platform. Just download the Cairo 7 app on your Roku, Amazon, Fire, or Apple TV to enjoy more Cairo 24-7. Thank you for watching this Black History Month profile and in-depth look at the history of the Liberty Bank building. I'm Trace Leong. This has been a Cairo 24-7 special.